Three big banks failed in the United States in the course of just one week. That's more banks than have failed in the entire history of many countries. And yet, one group is suggesting there's a more sinister reason behind the failure of one bank. I, I promised this year I, 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 would, I, would, I would not go into this, but I, I found this to be too interesting and too coincidental. I, I wanted to share it with you and I'll let you make up your own mind. According to Coindesk.com, uh, from Reuters, Signature Bank's prospective buyers, Signature Bank being one of the banks that failed, they had cryptocurrency exposure in the bank. Now, according to Reuters, prospective buyers must agree to give up all crypto business if they want to take over the assets of the failed bank. Now, in all fairness, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation denied Reuters reporting. So we've got a he said, she said situation going on here. Uh, and that was added to the article after it was published. But let me share with you the article and you make up your mind for yourself. Signature Bank is on the market after being shuttered by New York State regulators on Sunday, but any potential buyer reportedly has to agree to a major caveat, no crypto. Reuters first reported the development on Wednesday evening, citing people familiar with the matter. The FDIC said bids for the bank must be submitted by Friday. The New York Bank's weekend closure came two days after the collapse of another bank, California-based Silicon Valley Bank, and less than a week after the voluntary closure of another California-based bank, Silvergate. All three of those now defunct banks were considered crypto-friendly financial institutions. And so, you had three of the biggest, most crypto-friendly institutions in the United States. They're gone now. Could be coincidental. What I've said to people who are in the United States and they get excited when you see a politician, often it's just one politician or a small handful of politicians, saying, we're going to propose legislation to bring crypto to the forefront. We want to be innovators. People get excited. And I believe, as someone who's on the other side of the looking glass and who's already left the United States, who went where I was treated best, I say that some of those folks, perhaps many of them, are holding on to any shred of optimism because they like living in the United States, and yet they hate the fact that their country is against a lot of this innovation, even while proclaiming to be for innovation. Their country is, has incredibly high tax rates and really just goes against many of the very libertarian principles that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency wanted to bring about. And I have dealt with this in many situations in my life where you so much want to hold on to a belief that someone or something will come around to what you believe. They'll come around to the light. They'll see the light eventually. And you know, I've been telling you for a long time, there's no incentive for a big country like the United States to embrace and to empower a technology whose very existence is designed to underpin its superiority. Little countries do that kind of thing. And that's why you've seen Malta and Bermuda and the Bahamas and all kinds of these you know, small countries around the world. Now you're starting to see more influential countries like the UAE, you know, they want to get on board. But countries that want to innovate, countries that want to put themselves on the map, people that have a forward-thinking vision. If you go to the UAE, the people who work in the government are actually smart people. They don't hire dumb people. They don't hire somebody who used to you know, manage a, a subway line and put them as the minister of health. They put people who are smart that often come from the private sector. And so people like that are forward thinking. Small countries looking for a way to put themselves on the map and bring in an influx of high paying jobs. They do that. A big country that collects lots of tax money that has the global reserve currency, what, what interest do they have? Especially as the culture of that country is going against the libertarian principles that crypto stands for. Why would they want this? And so I've always said, if you can work with a US bank that's crypto friendly, that's fine. But you're much more likely to have sustainable crypto friendliness in other jurisdictions where it actually benefits the country rather than benefits the individual bank. These banks do exactly what I think uh, entrepreneurship in the United States does. It is a small number of people who are going against the grain of a society. Right? These days, go-getter entrepreneurs, yes, that spirit is somewhat in the United States, but it is going away. It is more and more people who want socialism, give me a check, universal basic income, why am I working? Why do we need to do all this for? And you've got a small number of people trying to change things. They are gonna be overpowered by the politicians who take their cues from the majority of people who don't like libertarian leaning stuff. 
And so the sustainability in crypto friendliness is offshore in jurisdictions that want uh, to be innovative. So we've established all three of these defunct banks were considered crypto friendly financial institutions. Signature Bank, whose crypto clients accounted for a quarter of its deposits, was reportedly under investigation by the Department of Justice and the SEC for potential lax monitoring that may have enabled money laundering. A class action lawsuit was filed against the bank in February, alleging they knew about and facilitated the quote unquote now infamous FTX fraud. Specifically, that suit accuses Signature Bank of having knowledge of and permitting the commingling of uh, the exchange's customer funds within its proprietary blockchain based payment system, Signet. Many of the crypto industry, including former acting comptroller of the currency and one time Binance US CEO Brian Brooks, have speculated the closure of the three banks is indicative of a coordinated effort by regulators to choke the crypto industry off from the banking system. Barney Frank, remember him? I'm old enough to remember Barney Frank. Maybe some of you youngins aren't. Barney Frank was a pretty liberal uh, representative from Massachusetts. Now he was a board member of Signature Bank and a former uh, Democratic US congressman who authored Dodd-Frag, right, which increased regulation on banks. Also suggested the takeover was spurred by an anti-crypto crypto motive, telling CNBC that Signature Bank was solvent and that regulators intervened anyway to send a message. I think part of what happened was that regulators wanted to send a very strong anti-crypto message, Frank told CNBC. However, the New York uh, Department of Financial Services has denied that crypto had anything to do with it uh, and their decision to shutter Signature Bank instead said it was due to a crisis of confidence. It sounds like the title of a book that like a presidential candidate would write, but a crisis of confidence in the bank's leadership and then the FDIC didn't return uh, a request for comment from Coinbase. Now, I'm not involved. I've not studied the books of these banks. I am watching this from afar. But I do think when you have a former Democratic representative who authored uh, perhaps the signature, uh, no pun intended, uh, you know, piece of, of legislation of a generation to regulate the banking sector, when he's on the board of a bank and says, hey, I think they did something because they don't want crypto. And when you've surmised for years that big countries don't want to challenge their authority and they don't want to embrace things like crypto, even if a few politicians within the system do, the overall system does not want this, you start to think, is there something to that? Because yes, uh, I have read some people saying, uh, these banks, they were, not, they were not at death's door. Right, and, and they're saying the broader financial system is not at death's door either. Right? What's the, I, I don't necessarily want to get into the doom and gloom. Oh, all the banks are terrible. I, I'm not so convinced that's the case here. I do believe you should use this as an example to diversify your banks. If you're one of those people who had, has one bank account for yourself or your, for your business, you've got to fix that immediately, starting domestically. But I would say use this as an opportunity to go exploring offshore opportunities. If you're an American, you will legally report those accounts so that the Treasury knows where they are because you're not trying to hide your money. You're just trying to diversify it and protect it. Um, this is an opportunity to diversify. Uh, but I think it's also an opportunity to diversify, especially if you are in a space that is innovative. It could be cryptocurrency. It could be anything else that may not be as well understood or as well liked um, you know, by financial institutions uh, in the US. We have very good banking relations with a couple of banks uh, in the US. And yet I'm sure there are many that wouldn't understand a company that does business all around the world, uh, a company that helps people leave the US. Uh, because they're tired of the overregulation, they're tired of the high taxes, they're tired of their freedoms being assailed. And so it is interesting to me. I will let you make up your own mind because the FDIC has said, hey, this is wrong. Uh, so who knows who's right or wrong? But the idea, I mean, just watch the documentary recently uh, when Treasury put all the bank CEOs in a room and said, you're going to sign this paper and take our money and we're essentially nationalizing your industry. You know, that's pretty common knowledge. Do you think it's beyond regulators to say, hey, we're selling this bank, but you need to also accomplish this objective we'd like to solve at the same time? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but it's certainly not beyond the realm of possibilities. And so for me, it's a call to diversify my money. And once I'm diversifying my money, I'm going to start to ask myself, if I'm doing something 
that I can do anywhere, whether it's crypto investing or running an online business or whatever it may be, why am I staying in a country that wants to squash my freedom of choice, wants to squash my economic freedom, whose economic freedom ranking has dropped pretty much every year since I've been following it at 12 years old. For a quarter of a century, countries like the United States are following an economic freedom. Other countries that are embracing new technologies are rising, like the UAE and others. Why don't I just go and live there? Yes, even as though I have citizenship-based taxation as an American, I can still dramatically reduce the taxes I'm paying in many cases on my business. Uh, and so why not go with my money and go where I'm treated best? That's what nomad capitalist helps people do. We help people figure out, I'm an American, I wanna move over here, I wanna put my money in a separate country, I wanna have my company in a separate country, how do I manage all that so I don't have to coordinate nine different lawyers and accountants? I wanna stay legal, I wanna be compliant, I wanna do the right thing and, and, and stay out of trouble, but I wanna save money and I wanna stop being harassed because I continue to believe that if you keep all your money in the US, that's just not gonna be a friendly place for innovation. Uh, I'm not saying all your money is going to be taken or it's going to be doom and gloom or all this stuff. People, I'm just saying it's not going to, it's not going to go in the right direction. This is yet another opportunity. I, 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 I wouldn't put it past them to say, hey, if you want to buy this business, you've got to, you got to take care of this for us. Uh, and that should be all you have to know.